my big question for you is, how do we ensure that we can avoid these science fiction-like scenarios where biological robots end up harming humanity? Do you ever think about that? I'm Insu Hyun, a bioethicist and the director of life sciences at the Museum of Science. Today, I talk with Ritu Raman, who is an assistant professor of mechanical engineering at MIT. Today, we talk about her work in biological robots and take a deep dive into where this field is heading in the future. Thank you, Ritu, for joining us. I'm so excited to have you. You are in the Department of Mechanical Engineering at MIT. And I think when people think about mechanical engineering, they assume you're talking about engineering of things that involve gears and plastic and metal, like, like the robots we saw earlier at the museum. But that's not what you do. You work with really different kinds of materials. Your engineering is, um, is of a different nature. Can you tell me more about that? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think I also started with this very traditional view of what a mechanical engineer does, which is you make machines, something that does something, and the materials that I started building with initially were metals and polymers because that's what I saw everything in my built environment was. Um, but obviously, most of the materials that we interact with daily, um, outside of the context of things we actually make, um, are all biological. So not only our own bodies, people we interact with, animals, pets, trees, are all biological systems, and all of those are made with living cells. Mm -hmm. um, and so I try to think about living cells themselves as a material that we can manipulate um, and build with in the same way that we build with other kinds of materials. So why would you move from like working with plastics, polymers, uh, metals to living cells? That sounds so difficult. <laughs> why, why would you like even bother to move over to that other world? Yeah, yeah. It's a great way to think about it in terms of um, the why has to be motivated mm -hmm. by something that makes it so incredible and so interesting that it is worth the difficulty. And so one of the things I think the most easy way to visualize it is think about the things that you can do mm -hmm. that a you know robot or machine you typically interact with can't. So we could pick up our phones right now, throw it on the ground, it's going to be cracked and say, all right, well, <laughs> there's a thousand dollars you're not getting back, right? Mm -hmm. um, but you could fall off your chair right now and bruise yourself or maybe even break a bone but you would be able to recover from that. Um, and that kind of dynamic ability to adapt to your surroundings, not only negative cues like damage, but even things like you know, training for a marathon and being able mm -hmm. to be very strong, um, all of those things are enabled by the fact that you are made out of materials that are inherently adaptive to their environments. So that's why you wanna, it's worth it to up mm -hmm. that difficulty because then you can get this dynamic response capability. So there had to have come a time where it became possible to switch the types of materials you work with, the types of things you build with. What was that key period and, and, and what enabled that crossover to living materials? One of the things that I think is particularly exciting about the time we're living in is that we're at this sort of point of convergence between biology getting more sophisticated, so our own understanding of how cells work in their natural environment, how to manipulate them in petri dishes, keep them alive for a long period of time, mm -hmm. keep them happy, um, and engineering. So tools for you know, looking at things that are really small, assembling things that are really small. And so if you have the ability to look at things that are small and move them around and manipulate them, and you have the biological understanding of how to keep a cell alive in a petri dish and not just mm -hmm. in a body, then you can start putting these two things together. And that has been, you know, certainly we've been culturing cells in petri dishes for decades and decades, but we've been able to understand more different types of cells, um, more complicated types of cells, and assembling cells into 3D tissue-like structures mm -hmm. much more recently. Um, and so we're just, we just happen to be very lucky that you know, this kind of work is happening at the same time that, you know, we're having the kinds of ideas we're having. Do you ever get, resistance is too strong of a word, but just people who are a little bit concerned about the direction of your research would say, you know, Rishu, you need to be really careful. We don't want to get into, and I kind of brought up science fiction, right? Mm -hmm. but, but, but what are some of the concerns people have raised about your work? And, and what do you think about those concerns? I haven't gotten too much concern, primarily because I would say most of the time I try to have longer form conversations with people. And when I do that, I can have enough time to explain to them why it is interesting to understand how people move um, and particularly motivate applications in medicine alongside applications in robotics. And that usually 
I think sets people up to look at it from a positive mindset. Where I have received more of that negative feedback is more, you know, you publish a paper, somebody writes an article about it, somebody tweets something about the article, and then it's like playing telephone. And at that point, all they've written is biological robot cyborg scary. <laughs> um, and so there, I think, you know, it's particularly meaningful to then walk back towards the motivation of, I, I don't want to make a robot that's not, that's annoying to people or you know, makes me feel bad about how I've spent my Nobody life's Nobody wants work. annoying robots. No, no. Um, and so I explained to them, like, this is why I made it. And these are some things that were particularly interesting to me. And also, here's how it could potentially have applications in medicine. Um, and I feel like those have been constructive conversations, but it always requires time, a shared vocabulary, and I think the ability to put aside your ego um, and just have a real conversation with another human being. Is there anything in your field that you're concerned about that might happen? Any hesitation? I think I do have some concerns um, broadly about, I would say, you know, what we're doing is we're often synthesizing multiple different fields, right? So some, yes, we're, it's biology, it's engineering, but even within biology, we sometimes use genetic engineering tools, for example, to make cells that are a little bit tweaked. So maybe instead of just responding to an electrical stimulus, they can also respond to a light stimulus. That's a cool thing to do for a robot. But, you know, we've also seen examples in genetic engineering, for example, where somebody is modifying an embryo um, and potentially doing something that might affect somebody for their whole life. And can you really get consent from that person that you're, um, whose life you're impacting? So it's, the thing I'm concerned about is that we are at the intersection of so many fields mm -hmm. that it feels very difficult to be at, a, at the state of the art in everything and feel that you're not on several runaway carts at the same time, if mm -hmm. that makes sense. Yeah. So we're here at Harvard Square, and I don't know if you've ever been here before, but this is a really cool comic book store called The Million Year Picnic. Cool. Thought we'd just pop in and see what we have there. Yeah, check super out, excited. Check out the comics. Are you a comic book fan? Are you a huge comics? comic book fan. Yeah. Was there ever an idea that you saw in the comics that you thought would be really cool to actually build in the lab? Yeah, absolutely. I think um, one thing that's come up for me a lot in the lab is thinking about the Flash, you know? So uh -huh. his superpower is that he can run really quickly and I work with muscle, of course. Uh -huh. And so the question becomes, you know, how is he able to turn his muscle on and off that fast? Because that's not something obviously that we're able to do. Mm -hmm. And so I get really caught up on that question a lot and I think like, how could I try to make something like that in the lab? You know, it might be interesting. Um, so that's definitely a comic book sparked idea that I'm, I'm working on. You know, on. I have a good friend who got inspired to become a bioengineer because uh -huh. he saw Empire Strikes Back and that last scene when Luke has that robotic hand, when he was oh. a little kid, he thought that was so cool. I wonder if I can make something like that. And that's yeah. how he got into <laughs> bioengineering. So you mentioned that biologically based machines could give you some advantage over non-biological based machines. But there's got to be downsides, right? Like, like you don't have to feed an iPhone like nutrients, but you would have to, right? With some of these other things you're talking about. Yeah, um, except you do have to feed an iPhone nutrients, mm -hmm. right? Because you got to charge it every right. day. Um, so everything, certainly everything has an energy cost. Um, one way of thinking about it actually, and I just discussed it in a mechanical engineering class earlier today, mm -hmm. is I asked people to name different kinds of actuators. So something that converts some form of energy into a mechanical force. Mm -hmm. um, and thinking about, you know, what are things that we see? And they said, oh, well, there's, you know, these shape memory alloys. So you heat it up and it changes shape. Mm -hmm. um, and they talked about pneumatic actuators. So things that look like balloons and they inflate and deflate. And I was like, yeah, you're right. You know, the actuator looks like it's this big. But for example, for things that inflate and deflate, what you don't see off camera typically is that there's a giant tank of compressed gas that's being mm -hmm. pumped in, pumped right. out. And so the energy source is always quite big and large. Um, and in our bodies, if you actually think about the fact that the main energy source we're using, for example, for muscle, which is the actuator we use, is sugar. And sugar is actually an incredibly dense energy source. And if you compare the amount of force an actuator is able to generate per not only the size of the actuator, but also the energy source, muscle is very, very efficient. Mm -hmm. um, and that's just one example of a tissue. So what are some of the things you work on? What are the creations you make in your lab? 
In my lab, we're particularly focused on how living creatures navigate their world, navigate really unpredictable environments. And so the tissue system that we work on is the motor control system. So not only you know, moving and walking around, which mm-hmm. certainly takes muscles, but also how do you plan that motion? How do you recruit certain muscles? And how do you coordinate some sort of interesting activity? So it could be walking, it could be dancing, it could be gripping something. Um, so we think about all of the cell types that are involved in mm-hmm. coordinating and executing motion, and we try to replicate that in our lab. How big are the things you make? Right now? Um, most of the things we make are in the millimeter to centimeter scale, so you can mm-hmm. certainly see them with your eyes, but you know, to see any great detail, you'd probably need to look in a microscope. And that's actually by design, because it turns out, and this is a different thing for different tissues, but it turns out for muscle, if you look at something that's at the millimeter to centimeter scale, you have enough of the tissue that you can recapture a lot of the behaviors that you might see in a much larger muscle, like in my own leg. But it's also small enough that we can, in a not cost prohibitive manner, Mm -hmm. make a bunch of them and Mm -hmm. test out a bunch of hypotheses on what works or what Mm -hmm. doesn't work. Mm -hmm. So engineering is a discipline that tries to solve problems. Mm -hmm. Uh, So what kind of problems could this kind of engineering do, uh, resolve? I think I tend to split the problems that we think about into both short term and longer term. So the longer term problem that we are focused on is robotics. We think about, well, there's a lot of different robots like the ones we've seen out here in the museum that can navigate cool environments and and in ways that are similar or at least recapitulate things that humans or other animals can do. Um, But again, all of these things, because they're made out of metal or plastics, Mm -hmm. cannot really dynamically respond to their surroundings. So our thought is, could we make robots that are like that, Mm -hmm. um, but because they are part biological, be able to do things like exercise and get stronger or heal from damage. Um, That's a very long-term goal that we're working towards. But as we're doing it, what we're doing is we're creating these tiny model systems of muscle and nerves and other things that control movement in our bodies. And so when we're studying things like, how does this tiny little tissue recover from damage? Mm -hmm. We're actually learning, how might I recover from damage? Or how could I accelerate my recovery from damage? And so our shorter term applications, and shorter term still means you know multiple years or decades, mm-hmm. um, are looking at things like how can I learn from these systems how we recover from muscle injury or nerve injury, and then turn that into a therapy that might be able to restore mobility to people who have lost it either through you know disease or through physical trauma. It sounds like the kind of things you're building have the capacity, the potential, maybe really far down the road of um, having some certain amount of autonomy, right? Um, How much sort of like self-regulation, self-control, agency even, would you want in something like that? Do you always want to have like like remote control over it or do you want it to kind of be able to do things on its own, so to speak? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. And I think it's something that could be very dependent on the application, Mm -hmm. right? So there might be certain things, for example, like a telesurgical device where you just don't want to fly out a surgeon, you don't have the capability to fly out a surgeon to a specific area, but we know that there are kind of robots that might be able to do things like suturing and they can control it. There you might want to have a lot of um, the control still primarily be from a human source, but there are certain parts of that that you could think well, you know, surgeons thinking about a lot of things. Is there something that, you know, the we could automate like suturing, for example? It's not a very particularly high risk task. So the surgeon can focus on, you know, thinking about how different blood vessels or nerves connect together. Um, so there could be some parts of it that are remote controlled and some parts that are autonomous. Um, similarly, you could think about, you know, a bomb disposal robot or other things where you're always thinking, what is the minimum level of complexity that I can endow to this that it adds value and reduces danger for a human being? Mm-hmm. Um, but you don't necessarily need it to be as smart as a human being unless you anticipate that you won't be able to communicate with it in real time. So these kinds of far off into the future mm-hmm. robots you're talking about, these biological robots, if there's any kind of quote unquote, and I'm using quotes, decision making involved, they would have to have some kind of like neural network. It, would mm-hmm. have, it can't just be like a lump of muscle, right? Yeah. Um, so how, how would you actually do that? Would you have to would you have to have like multiple parts, multiple biological parts put together? Some of it kind of neural in nature? Yeah. 
the thing that makes our bodies particularly interesting, right, is that they're made out of multiple types of cells. And the reason is that each cell type has its own specific thing that it's good mm -hmm. at, and then it can talk to other types of cells that are good at their thing. So when we're thinking about decision making, we generally say, all right, that's kind of the purview of different types of neurons that are interacting with each other. And so if we want to not even, you know, thinking about something as complex as cognition, but even have things like yes, no responses or deciding to go in this direction versus that direction. We think about not only having muscle, but also integrating motor neurons that are controlling muscle, as well as potentially sensory neurons that can, you know, detect the rate and degree of muscle stretch, other types of nerves into those systems. And so what we would need then is to have good understanding of each of those cell types and how to grow them and keep them happy, but also how to put them together and get them to talk to each other in a way that is productive mm -hmm. and yeah. leads to a desirable outcome. Richie, so if you had a superpower, what would it be? Hmm. It's a hard question. Um, I think I would be something like, you know, Ant-Man, like able to get really small because often I'm in lab and I'm like, why isn't this tissue working on? Why isn't it twitching or behaving the way I want? And I always think if I could just get really small and get in there, I could just see like <laughs> how are the cells talking to each other, you know? Oh man. Yeah. Always for work reasons. <laughs> well, I guess if I had to have a superpower, I'm a terrible singer. Mm -hmm. So I always dream of like singing really well. So like maybe my superpower could be like, I'm such a good singer. I, I unite opposing forces. Like I bring people together. <sighs> Well, I thought it would be like breaking glass, you know, like an opera singer. I went violent, well, well, you know, but you, you went you could, good. You could, you could do that with it with a singing voice, but I want to yeah. bring harmony. Maybe I like watched too much Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure growing up. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah. That's a great goal. So I've seen some pictures of the things, some of the things you created. One was very memorable. It looked like a, a little sushi piece. So it was like a, a strip of muscle, mm -hmm. you know, it's on top of like a plastic strip and you hit it with mm -hmm. some light and it contracts and it moves. Now, I remember you saying when you presented this work that um, the more they move, the stronger they got. So mm -hmm. they kind of like exercise and they got larger mm -hmm. and then you can cut them and they would heal. Were either of those things planned or did it, just, did it surprise you that it could do that? Yeah, um, I think, they were things that I wanted to believe were possible mm -hmm. because that was like the whole motivating point of wanting to do it, right? It's like you can always make a robot that walks, but at the end of the day, um, as exciting as that video was for me, I think if somebody had asked me to directly pit my tiny robot that's crawling across a Petri dish compared to, you know, one of the big legged robots that we're used to seeing, I'd be like, yeah, it's slower, you know? So <laughs> what I wanted to show is that, but it's it's cool because it can do things that that robot can't do. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, I think first started with exercise because that's kind of, when we think about muscle, that's the way we, we talk about it and think about it and have a very learned experience with it, right? We all know the experience of getting weaker or stronger based on our diet and our activity levels. So I just wanted to try that out um, on them. So just getting them to contract every day, walk every day, see how that impacted, not only how much force they were producing, but also how mature the muscle was and what proteins were in that muscle that we made. And then once we did that, we figured, well, that's what happens when, you know, you have a gain of function or good cue for in your environment. But what happens when bad things happen, like a damage or disease? Mm -hmm. And so then the obvious next step was to go in and kind of use a scissor, make a little cut in the muscle mm -hmm. and then look at how it responded. And we did end up seeing that they could recover from that loss. Wow. And it was a very, very exciting finding. That, that must have been very exciting. So my big question for you is, how do we ensure that we can avoid these science fiction-like scenarios where biological robots end up harming humanity? Do you ever think about that? I do, I do. I think it's really important to think about that. I mean, part of it, I think about it because I watch a lot of science fiction and mm -hmm. superhero content. Um, uh -huh. So, and I think one of the great things about that medium is it allows us to explore these kinds of questions. And I think it's true for any branch of science or engineering or innovation. Anytime you make something new, Sure, you're probably starting off thinking, well, I'm studying this because I'm interested in disease. I'm studying this because I want to make a cooler robot. But it is possible for somebody to use it for something that you didn't intend. Mm -hmm. So I think it's always a useful thing to think about. One of the ways I would say, you know, when I think about mitigating that possibility in my own research is always matching the complexity of the system we're making to the needs of the application. How complicated, how strong, how smart, 
does something need to be in order to be mm-hmm. minimally functional in some environment and not necessarily you know give it abilities that yes human beings and other living creatures have like reproduction for example that might not really have any value um, in a robotics context yeah what i really find very fascinating very exciting about engineering today mm-hmm. is that um, there's the possibility of creating all kinds of different designs that can do really new things, exciting things. Um, but whenever you design something, you kind of have to make some trade-off decisions because there are always going to be constraints, right? Cost constraints or some constraints, but even the technology itself or time, there's some limitation happening. So you have to make some adjustments along the way of, of what you're planning to do. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, there are some examples, for example, if, if you're trying to build Going back to more like traditional mechanical engineering, if you're trying to build like a really efficient city car, it has to be very safe, but also super efficient. And after a while, those goals start to fight against each other because the more safety equipment you add to it, the less efficient it gets, the lighter it gets, the less safe it gets. So you have to constantly decide, well, what is that trade-off point? What are the values that we're using to, to uh, make a decision to going one way or another? You know, there's this saying in cycling, I'm a cyclist, and, you know, strong, cheap, and light, pick two, because you can't have all three, right? Um, so when you're making a, you know, a new, thinking of a new project, thinking of a new um, thing to create, what are some of the trade-off decisions that are kind of in your mind? You know, like what are some of the tough choices you have to make and what are some of the constraints you face? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And actually, I remember reading I think the car example in a a paper you wrote and I use it all the time whenever people ask me this question because I'm like yeah people are making these decisions about every piece of technology so I think it's very compelling I mean I think cost is always Mm -hmm. up there (laughs) Mm -hmm. as a as a reason so you know especially when you're working with living cells Mm -hmm. um, maintenance is a huge issue you're buying the cells you're buying all the food to give them which can be some very expensive proteins and growth factors and hormones you have to keep them warm all the time Mm -hmm. you have to keep Mm -hmm. them hydrated in a perfect environment that kind of mimics the inside of your body so all of that adds up Uh Um, but in addition to that cost constraint the additional constraints that I mentioned, like it has to be at body temperature, it has to be in a humid environment, all of those needs need to be met as well in order for the system to function. Um, So I would say those are kind of most of the parameters we optimize around, like how do we Mm -hmm. keep the cells most happy? And then how do we use the cell type that has the most amount of complexity for what we want to do, but is not so unreasonably expensive um, that we can't make, you know, Mm -hmm. 10 robots and try different things. You know, comics are such a striking visual medium. Mm -hmm. I wonder if um, engineers could sort of benefit from that kind of striking art that comics brings to the public. You know, um, sometimes it's hard to get people's understanding of what it is that you do by even like PowerPoint slides or, Mm -hmm. or showing videos. But if you can maybe convey these areas that you work in through imagery like this, yeah. instead of scaring people, it might actually inspire them. Like I think art could be really useful for, for the kind of work that you do. Yeah, yeah, I think that's really beautiful. Often, you know, I think scientists, we're always trying to communicate our ideas through writing and mm-hmm. images and figures, but usually to other scientists to present our work. Um, I think using it as a form of science communication could really, really help us kind of think about how we would explain really complex phenomena that might be hard to visualize just based on words through mediums like this. Are the things that you create in the lab sort of, um, do they look the way they do because it's all functionality or do you ever kind of think a little bit about, um, lack of a better term, like marketability, like kind of acceptance, like you know how it might look might lead to people's better acceptance of what it is that you do? Mm-hmm. That's a great point, actually. I'm not sure that I've ever thought about the aesthetic appeal or impact of the work, but I think um, it could be particularly useful when thinking about, you know, you can make any of a wide variety of robots, but there might be something that's a little bit more appealing or interesting or capturing the imagination. So maybe I'll have to give that some thought. What I find interesting and very, very promising about this direction of engineering is there could be um, a very intentional approach to this, right? So, so instead of just having the people that traditionally are there at the lab meeting, brainstorming and, and, and thinking about, you know, going this way rather than that way, 
could other people who normally are not part of the lab, but kind of you know represent a little bit more societal attitudes and concerns, should they be involved in some of that discussion early on as you're kind of planning you know a design of something? Because of course, you're always building something that you think is going to be useful for society, but shouldn't some people from society have some some say in that process, that creative process? Yeah, yeah. I think the place that I found it most effective to do something, have those kinds of conversations, and actually I did it just before walking over here, I was at the biomaker space at MIT. Um, and what this is, is like it's a maker space so people can learn how to build different things, but it's focused on building with biology. And we host these workshops there that are for broader community members, not just, you know, it could be somebody from the business school or somebody in administrative staff who can come in, learn how to work with cells, and they try to make our muscle tissues. Um, which gives them a lot of the basic vocabulary of the kinds of things we work with. And then I usually go and visit that class. And when I have conversations of like, this is what we're working on, et cetera, et cetera, they can often ask some of the most interesting questions of the next things that we could pursue because they don't necessarily have a bunch of preconceived notions or inhibitions about what is or isn't possible. So I found those kinds of discussions very, very valuable. Um, I think I tend to think of the biomaker space as kind of an extension of my lab, so I would still consider it in that group meeting context. My students help run that workshop. Yeah, I think when people are really worried about science fiction scenarios, dystopian scenarios of these kinds of technologies and where they may be heading. Perhaps they feel that way because they feel really disconnected from the creative process and, and, uh, and they feel like they have no control over what the future might portend. So it might be even just good science and good um, uh, public relations just to involve people and include their voice in that earlier process. So there might be kind of a, even like a self-interested reason to, yeah. to bring in that, that kind of dialogue. You've been doing lots of really interesting work also in the space of getting people excited about STEM, especially uh, girls. And can you tell me a little bit more about that, that work in that arena? Yeah. I mean, I think for me, I think about the reasons that I got into a STEM career. Um, and my, my mom, my dad, my grandfather were all engineers, um, mechanical, chemical, civil engineer, and they're kind of people that were very actively building, physically building tangible things that were solving problems in their communities. And that was very exciting to me. I wanted to do something that was meaningful. I wanted to feel like I had a positive impact. That was what brought me to STEM. And I think that's why it makes sense to engage with other people to know what are the things that are what are the things that are bothering them mm -hmm. and how can I solve those problems, right? It gives you some meaning. And kind of tied in with that is then the question of, we can ask a lot of people what's bothering you, but then if we have only one kind of person solving those problems, mm -hmm. we have a certain set of ideas that we're exploring and a large parameter space that we're ignoring. I think we just have a ton of unsolved problems. It seems silly to me that we would exclude half the population, if not more, mm -hmm. um, from that kind of problem solving. And so I think it is self-interested you know, for everybody to say, how do I get the best, smartest, most interesting, exciting people um, working on the stuff that will make all of our lives more comfortable and fun? And so that's why I am particularly motivated not only to share science, but also I don't think I, I wouldn't think of it so much as like getting girls interested in science. I think everybody is interested in science by nature. Um, you just have to see kids running around a museum to like know that. But it's more preserving their confidence that that is something they can be good at um, when there's a lot of societal and cultural cues that push against it. Right. Did you face any of that when you were growing up? I, I, you said you came from an extremely you know scientific family and uh, full of engineers. But but did you did you feel some of that growing up? Yeah, I think that. I was very privileged in that I had an inside bubble that was very different from the outside bubble, right? So from the outside world, I, like everybody else, was getting certain cues about girls aren't good at math, there aren't a lot, there just clearly were not that many female scientists as role models to look up to. We weren't like, you know, talking about that robot that was made by that girl. That was never a thing. Um, not on TV, not in real life. And if I hadn't had the privilege of my family, which not only showed me a woman who was an engineer, but also men who respected her as an engineer, I don't know that I would have had the confidence and the courage to kind of pursue that path. Um, so it's certainly, I think, a particularly lucky accident for me, but I would like to give other people that sort of confidence bubble. If they can't find it in their family, hopefully they can find it elsewhere. So do you think that comic books could be used to teach 
like young folks, students, some important concepts. I mean, you know, you can like go anywhere with comics. You can go on any topic. You can take it in any, any direction. It would seem like you could use something like this to teach younger folks some really cool concepts. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I'm actually the advisor for a comic book series on young girls in science. Oh, really? um, so I think it's something that sort of conveys real scientific concepts, but is mm -hmm. a little bit more engaged in outreach. And actually, even here, I've kind of found a bunch of things that are a little more targeted at adults, like a medical memoir that walks people through the experience of what it might be like to have breast cancer. So oh. it's just a really useful mm -hmm. medium to talk about things, I think. Yeah, I mean, in my area of bioethics, there's so many like science fiction like scenarios that people want to talk about, and if you can if you can engage them in a way with a comic mm -hmm. to walk through some of these scenarios and to actually teach them along the way, you know, some important questions that come up in research, I think that could be really a really cool next step. Maybe we should start something where like you know we actually have academic comics that yes. you can use. <laughs> I would be very into that idea. Yeah. So, are there disciplines or are there other researchers who? you wish you could collaborate more with like types of researchers um, you know, uh, that really you think would really take the field to the next level? Is there, is, are there conversations that should be happening that are not really happening? Some sets of conversations that I've been particularly enjoying over the past year um, is that I've, I'm learning more about the different branches of biology. Hmm. In the past, I was mostly thinking about biology as human biology or biology of other mammals, for which can be translated to humans, because I was mostly interested in medicine and medical applications. As we think more about this robotics work, um, I've been having really interesting conversations with biologists who study squirrels and ants and whales, mm -hmm. and realizing that the way that they create movement is actually different and very exciting and could be leveraged in robotics even if it doesn't have applications in medicine. And so getting that kind of flavor and breadth has been very nice, especially because I think, you know, going back to this ethical perspective, their motivation is a lot of like just natural curiosity about the biological world and not just disease going to cure it. Um, and I think it's very exciting to think about that as a motivation as well. Do you ever think about possible collaborations with artists? I mean, um, I, I ask that because in my experience in bioethics, a lot of time people, maybe subconsciously, make moral judgments about what they think about something novel based on mm -hmm. how it looks. Mm -hmm. If it looks scary, if it mm -hmm. looks gross, it's evil. Yeah. If it's beautiful and pleasant, it's yeah. it's beautiful. And, and when you look at mythologies, that's kind of how things play out. The mm -hmm. good characters are beautiful and the evil ones are gross. Mm -hmm. um, so it kind of maybe viscerally matters to people how things look and they come to a snap judgment. There's a possibly a real opportunity to sort of be very mindful of what these things look like because that might elicit a response. I, I wonder, are there opportunities? Are there conversations with designers kind of more in the aesthetic realm? Mm -hmm. Um, that yeah. could be kind of an interesting way of getting people together and, and, and maybe move the field forward in a, in a positive direction. Just your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think, I think that's a really, really interesting point because I had always thought of it as, you know, an outreach or communication tool of, oh, well, not everybody learns from podcasts, not everybody learns from reading. Mm -hmm. Some people are more visual and that's great. But now that you bring up this other point of visual cues often re lead to visceral moral judgments, mm -hmm. that's very true. I can think of things where I'm like, I like that, I don't like it, from, mm -hmm. from nothing else than just looking at it. Right. I think that's super, super interesting and would be something that I'd really like to explore further, thinking mm -hmm. about not only how can it be used to educate and share, um, but also cultivate feelings of warmth and optimism. I think it could be, and again, I'm so excited by this field because I see some, so much interesting potential. And one area that might be unex, underexplored but could be fruitful is this idea of breaking down the barriers or, or the assumed barriers between art and engineering. Mm -hmm. uh, why do they have to be different silos? I mean, what, why can't one inspire the other? Can't they co-conspire and work together to to complement each other. So it would be really fascinating to fast forward several years from now and to say, you know, uh, look at the great stuff coming out of Ritu's lab or, or MIT that's not only useful, but just mm -hmm. beautiful. Yeah. That'd be wonderful. It would be wonderful. And I think to your point, I don't see science as separate from art because mm -hmm. often what we're doing is we're saying, there's a thing, right? I need to get from here to there. Um, but that's all, that's the problem. 
but you could build stairs, you could build a rope, you could swing from here to there. There's so many ways and each person would design that solution differently. And to me, that is art. So I don't really see a distinction, at mm -hmm. least in my head, between the fields. When you look out at the natural world, like what inspires you the most? Like what in your wildest dreams would you love to somehow leverage or <laughs> you know, utilize or mimic? Uh, is there anything in particular that you feel like, wow, if I could, if I could accomplish something that could do something kind of like that, it would be awesome. Yeah. <laughs> I think the thing that kind of excites me the most is the diversity of our natural world, right? Because, yes, of course, we see humans do incredible things. There's stuff that I can do, which is exciting. There's the stuff that an Olympian can do, much more exciting, one might argue, or a TikTok dancer, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, but also yesterday, for example, I met with a student who didn't have a very similar background to me, but they just showed me a video on their phone of a trap jaw ant. And mm -hmm. they can like basically snap the head off of termite so incredibly fast, <laughs> right? And I, I visibly gasped, which I have not uh -huh. done in a research <laughs> meeting in a really long time. And similarly, you know, you might see hummingbirds or mm -hmm. fishes and they're all doing, and there's so many kinds of animals. And every time you see these videos, I think you feel this like childhood level, uh -huh. oh my gosh, that's so cool, um, that you can still capture at any time. And the nice thing there is the diversity is there's so many different kinds of animals that can do all of these different things. And so I'm very excited, I think, about not just getting inspiration from humans or dogs or things we see more normally, which are very exciting, but also thinking more broadly about all of the, the natural biodiversity. So you said that, that you, you almost felt like childlike when you saw that video. Of, yeah. As a child, what, what did you see that made you gasp? <laughs> Yeah. Um, so one of the other exciting things about my childhood is that I spent one of my, my first memories are growing up in Kenya. Um, mm -hmm. So I was born in India. I moved to Kenya when I was very young. So that's kind of a lot of my early memories are coded there. Um, and part of my um, dad's job was we lived in the city during the weekdays, but on the weekends we would travel to rural villages to mm -hmm. help put up communication towers. Mm -hmm. And when you're in a more rural setting, of course, there's just more nature. That right? is and not a typical childhood, by no, the way. No, it's, it's not typical at all, but it's so wonderful because Kenya mm -hmm. is naturally a very beautiful place, uh -huh. not just, you know, not even excluding animals like mountains, grass, uh -huh. waterfall, all those Sunsets. things. Sunsets. And yeah. then going on safari as a child, mm -hmm. on the same week that I watched The Lion King, I went on safari and let me tell you that's also very atypical. that was <laughs> very atypical but it is hard to shake that experience mm -hmm. and it's hard not to be so excited about the natural world around us well that excitement still comes through in your work uh, i'm so happy you joined us today this is such a fun conversation thank you thank you for having me